So we're going to start on chapter 9 material. Chapter 9 covers the topics of impulse and momentum. Impulse and momentum will be very important when dealing with non-constant forces. We'll develop what's called the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, and from this we'll develop what is one of the most important uh, concepts in physics, which is the conservation of linear momentum. Uh, to date in class, we've dealt mostly with things that have been changing. The velocity has been changing, the position has been changing, and trying to predict uh, how these things will change. Well, now we're going to explore some things that stay the same in the next couple of chapters. And in physics and in science, when something stays the same, uh, we say that it's conserved. Uh, so mostly we've been dealing with constant forces up to date. Uh, however, many forces are not constant. Uh, a prime example would be a collision. We're going to deal with collisions an awful lot in this chapter. Another example would be an explosion. Uh, in these cases, the forces are not constant and they're very complicated. And so it would be nice to find a way to handle these. Uh, and so we're going to introduce two new concepts to deal with these cases, impulse and the conservation of linear momentum. So we'll start with defining linear momentum. Uh, any object that's moving has a linear momentum that looks like this. We use the letter P, sorry for this, uh, to describe the momentum. It equals the mass times the velocity. This is a vector quantity, and it's in the same direction as the velocity. The units are kilogram meters per second. And I like to think about this in terms of its components oftentimes. Uh, the x component and the y component, uh, which just depend on the x component and the y component of the velocity. Now one thing to keep in mind, uh, this can sometimes burn you, momentum can be negative. So make sure you keep that in mind. So let's start with Newton's second law. We've been using this, we know this pretty well. So we're going to start with Newton's second law. We're going to rearrange it a little bit. So we're going to start by our knowledge that the acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity. So we're doing this in the x direction. And so over here, uh, there would be dvx over dt is the definition of the acceleration. If I multiply both sides by a dt, I get an equation looking like this here, m dvx fx dt. And whenever you have uh, these differential elements on either side, you can integrate. And so here we're going to integrate this over some time period, all right, from t initial to t final, and from v initial to v final. If we integrate this side, all right, this is not too bad of an integral, you're just integrating over dv. And so you get, uh, on the left-hand side, just the difference in momentum, the change in momentum. So that's why we're talking about momentum. Uh, on this side, you get this integral over here, f dt. Now, basically what this is saying is this, the right-hand side describes uh, how the force acts. And so what this equation is saying is that when a force acts over some time over here, the result is the change in momentum, which change in momentum really for a particle means the velocity is changing. And so that's really just what we're saying with f equals ma. So we're just really literally rearranging this, right? If a force acts, we have an acceleration. Acceleration means you change your velocity. So now we're going to look and, and, and study this uh, impulse momentum, this, this equation down here, which is the impulse momentum theorem, this guy down here, a little bit more in depth. And we're going to start by looking at this right-hand side. So to look at the impulse a little bit better, it's kind of nice to look at a graph. So here we have a, a plot of force versus time, and here's the actual plot for a non-constant force. So you can see that it starts uh, pretty close to zero at the beginning. Uh, it peaks at some point, and it comes back down to zero again over some time, delta t. So this is a non-constant force, and what we're going to do is define the impulse to be j sub x. So the, uh, the impulse is the, uh, in the x direction is this right-hand side of the equation we had on that last slide. All right, so it's the integral f dt uh, over some time period. Now for us, in physics 131, what this really means to us is that the impulse is the area under the force versus time curve. So just this area in here, if we were to fill all this area in, uh, underneath the force versus time curve, that would be what the impulse would be. Okay, so we're not going to do too much in the way of dealing with integrals outside of that. Now, another way to think about this is to think about what we call the average force. And so here we can say that, alright, so the force starts at zero, ends at zero, and has some peak in the middle, uh, but overall there could be some value we define here, say, as the average force. And we set this up so that the impulse is the same. So the j sub x is, is the same as this complicated integral looking thing here. And it just makes it a little bit easier for us to work with. And so we can deal, since this force is constant, we deal with the average force. All right, so we're going to do that a lot. And so this is the average force times the time interval. The units of the impulse are force times time. 
which gives us newtons times seconds. If you work this out, you get the units of kilogram meters per second, the same units that we have for momentum. So writing out this new equation we have in its most compact form, it looks like this here. The, uh, the impulse equals the change in the momentum. And we can expand it out a little bit using our definition of the impulse in terms of the average force, and then just the definition of momentum and do it one more time. Uh, we'll be careful, this should be a vector here. There should be a little arrow here, not a little sign like that. Uh, and so this is our uh, impulse momentum theorem. This is a vector equation, and so it has different components. And so here's the x component and the y component. And again, the idea here is that if a force acts over some time, the result of this is a change in the momentum, which of course, in this case, for a particle, is a change in the velocity. Just very similar to F equals ma. Another way to think about it is running out like this. So we again, we say that this is the x component, jx equals delta px. That's the difference in the momentums. Now if we rearrange this equation a little bit, we get this here. And what this says is that if I have some initial momentum and um, due to some interaction with something, an impulse is added on this j sub x. You add the momentum in the impulse and you get the final momentum. Okay, so momentum after an interaction, like a collision or explosion, equals the momentum before plus the impulse that comes from this interaction. So that's a handy way to think about the impulse momentum theorem. Let's do an example. So maybe pause the, the movie right now and try this out and we'll talk about this when you're done. Okay, so hopefully you give this a try uh, and the answer comes out to be C. Let's go through this slowly and see how this comes out. Uh, so first of all, I like to draw a picture. Uh, and so in this picture here, we have a 0 0.14 kilogram baseball comes in at 48 meters per second. So that's about 100 miles per hour. Uh, the bat acts on the ball for a certain time period. And then we say that the ball leaves headed right for the pitcher with a speed of 38 meters per second. So we're trying to find the magnitude of the impulse that the bat imparted on the ball. And so in my picture, we'll call positive x direction to be that way. And we'll say that the initial case, so here I'm circling the initial case, the velocity of the ball comes in at negative 48. Again, this is just basically the way that I defined it. Uh, and then the final case, it, it hits off going back towards the pitcher with a speed of positive 38. So you have to be real careful about the signs here, like I was saying earlier. So if we take these two pictures, now we can use our impulse momentum theorem. Uh, so J equals delta PX. And we write it out uh, this way here. We're trying to find the impulse in this case, so we'll leave that on this side of the equation. And we fill in what we have here. So our final information and our initial information. And again, the key here is that these two negative signs are going to cancel. So it's really important, okay, this negative sign over here with the 48 was very important. If you forgot that, you would get the wrong answer. Uh, when I do this, I come out with this, uh, an impulse of 12 kilogram meters per second. Now, a follow-up question that is oftentimes asked for something like this is, okay, so what is the size of the force then? And to do that, we use our alternative definition of the impulse. That it's the average force times the change in time. The problem actually gave us the change in time. It's 2 times 10 to negative 3 seconds. And so we get that in this case here, which, you know, keep in mind, we use typical uh, velocities for a baseball. So the average force of this bat was about 6,000 newtons. Now let's give this one here a try. So here we have a problem, a uh, two kilogram object moving to the right with a speed of 0 0.5 meters per second experiences the force shown in the graph. What are the object's speed and direction after the force ends? So take this, uh, go ahead and pause and work on this and then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay, so the answer I get here is D. Let's look at this one. So again, we use our impulse momentum theorem, and now we're going to wrap it around, because what we're solving for here is we want to find, uh, in a sense, our final momentum, our final information. We want to find the final velocity. And so we set this up. And so the key here is how do we find the impulse? Well, okay, we have a few different ways to define it. One way we talked about is that's the area under the force versus time curve. And so if you look over here, I'm shading in roughly uh, the area of the force versus time curve. So it's a box of height two meters, uh, and width one half of a second. And so if we figure that out, the impulse is two times a half, or one newton seconds. Again, that's the way to talk about impulses in units of newton seconds. Uh, so if I plug this in, it's one newton second, it's the impulse, plus the initial momentum, which is the mass of two times 0 0.5, and what we get then is we get two newtons per second as the final momentum. Now momentum, remember, 
is just mass times velocity. So we divide this two newtons per second by the mass, which is two kilograms. We get a velocity of positive one meters per second out of this equation, the way we defined everything. So let's look at, uh, we have our alternative way to write Newton's second law. So I'm gonna start with this new equation over here, which is an alternative way to write Newton's second law. This says that the force net equals the first derivative of the momentum with respect to time. And I'm going to call this equation one. Now if we take this and plug in our definition of momentum, we get something like this here. Now we're going to assume that this is an object that's mass cannot change. So if the mass cannot change, it's not affected by the derivative and it can basically hop out of there. And so we get that the force net is equal to the mass times the first derivative of the velocity and the first derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. So lo and behold, we get F equals ma. All right, I'll call that equation two. So essentially, if the mass is not allowed to change, equation one and equation two are equivalent. So this is just a new way uh, to write Newton's second law. And in fact, this is the original way that Newton wrote it uh, back when he wrote it. So let's take this and see that we get an interesting result from this. So F net equals dp dt. Well, let's think about what happens if F net is zero. If F net is zero, we get this equation over here. Uh, the first derivative of the momentum equals zero. Now what does that mean with, with respect to time, rather? Well, what that means is if the, the derivative of momentum with respect to time is zero, the slope of the P versus T curve is zero. And so that means it doesn't change. It's just hanging out steady. Uh, so it's conserved in this case here. So what we're saying is that when the force net is zero, the momentum doesn't change. Another way to think about this is we can oftentimes write derivatives like dp over dt with little delta signs like here to understand it a little bit better. So if I take this and set that equal to zero, I can divide both sides by delta t and get rid of the delta t because it's times zero, and I get that delta p equals zero. This leads me to basically that the final momentum minus the initial equals zero, and that essentially leads me to the same idea we just had, that the momentum is the same. So when this net force equals zero, all right, we get that the momentum does not change or it's conserved. Now, this makes sense, hopefully. All right, when no forces act on an object, there is no change in momentum. For just a single object, that's pretty boring, right? We know that if there's no acceleration, uh, there'll be no change in velocity. So when there's no forces, there's no acceleration, no change in velocity, pretty boring. Uh, however, if we consider a whole system, we can find that this is a very useful idea. And by a system, we just mean a group of objects that interact with each other. It could be anything. It could be a bunch of billiard balls on a pool table. It could be the air in the room. Okay, there's a group of objects that interact somehow with each other. Now, when we talk about a system, we can define two different kinds of forces, internal and external. An internal force are forces that objects within the system exert on each other. So if, for instance, we pick the air in the room as our system, this would be the, uh, the force of different uh, molecules of air bouncing off of each other. And an external force is forces exerted on the objects by agents that are external to the system. So in our example of the air in the room, this would be the wall using the force on the air particles. Now, if you look at a picture, so here's two air particles. Right, anytime they collide, so let's say they collide in this direction, so the A uh, applies a force on B, we'll call it F sub AB in that direction. But whenever that happens, we know from Newton's third law that B applies the same force in the opposite direction. Okay, and so let's now look at our new equations. So here's the F net equals dP dt. Well, if we split these two forces into the external and the internal, Right, for a system, the internal always equals zero, because for every force, you always have the reaction force that will always cancel. And so we can rewrite this for a system like this here, that the net force external, anything outside of the system, equals dp dt. So what this means for us right here is that for a system of particles, if there are no external forces, then we get that the dp dt equals zero, like we were talking about before, and if dp dt equals zero, this means that the momentum is conserved. So the idea here is if there's nothing outside acting on your system, it's just the internal forces, this idea of momentum, this will be conserved. 
And so a way to sort of sum this up is that the total momentum of an isolated system remains constant. And so an isolated system is one where there's no outside forces. Nothing is uh, acting on that system. And so now we're going to take this idea. This is a very important idea and basically play around with this a little bit. Uh, and so uh, one of the best examples of this would be a billiards table. Okay, if you look at just the billiard balls on the pool table, when they hit each other, uh, it's only internal forces acting if you neglect the friction of the table, which is generally pretty small. And so these billiard balls conserve momentum to a large degree. And that's how when you hit them in a certain way, you're pretty sure you know which way they're going to go uh, because they do conserve momentum. Uh, so the way this works, again, so we have an isolated system. So we're going to talk about, the basically the hard part about this is figuring out when you have an isolated system. But when you have an isolated system, you can say that the initial momentum has to equal the final momentum. They can write this out as basically the sum of all the momentums of everything initially equals the sum of all of them finally, right? This sigma sign just means a sum. Uh, and so, now the thing about momentum is that this is a vector quantity, and so it can work in different directions. So you can conserve momentum in the x direction, or the y, or even sometimes both. You've got to be careful that you set that up. Now, what I do is I like to write it out like this. This is a little shortcut way uh, of the equation you use for momentum conservation. So a lot of times we only have two objects. If we have two objects, you can write it out this way here. This is like the initial side, this is the final side for the different objects. And of course, if there's a third object, you would write uh, you know, another mv on both sides. Just so keep in mind that you have one of these equations in each direction, the x and the y direction. Let's look at an example. So you guys do this. If a bomb of 45 kilograms explodes into two pieces, the first piece, 15 kilograms, moves off to the right with a velocity of 10 meters per second. The second piece moves off to the left. So here's our little picture. Pretty, pretty neat uh, sound effects. Uh, so I want to know is what velocity or what speed does the second piece have? So pause it, uh, give this a try, and let me know what you think. Okay, so the answer I get here is 5 meters per second. So let's look at this slowly. So again, the big key here is, is momentum conserved? And if you look at this bomb, right, here's a picture of the bomb after the explosions happened. So after the explosions happened, right, there's all sorts of little internal forces going on in here, all right? But once these things start flying off, the only force would be the force of gravity. And that's in our y direction. So if we define our x, y like this here, uh, there are no external forces in this system in the x direction, in the horizontal direction. All right? So the momentum is conserved in this case. It's not conserved in the y direction, but it's conserved in the x direction. We just want to know the velocity right after the explosion. So we don't really care what happens after that. Okay, so momentum is conserved in the y direction because no forces act on the bomb pieces except internal forces. So this is the hard part, is figuring out exactly when you can use this equation. So if we do this, here's our little handy dandy equation. Now, the momentum initially is zero. The bomb isn't moving at all initially, so it's just zero momentum initially. Uh, afterwards, the piece of 15 kilograms goes off positive 10 meters per second. Again, we're defining the positive direction to be in the right. And we know the other side goes off 30. Uh, it's got to be 30 kilograms because the total was 45. And we need to find the velocity. And so we arrange this around with some algebra, bring the, the 30 to the other side of the equation, uh, and then basically solve for this. And if we go through and solve for this, we get negative 5 meters per second. Now, the problem asks for the speed, so the speed would be 5, but the actual velocity would be negative 5 in this case here. Uh, and so what's happening is the momentum has to be conserved. It starts zero, and so what happens is whatever the momentum goes off in the other direction, the other guy has to have that same momentum in the opposite direction. So it's 15 times 10 in the positive direction. It's going to be 30 times negative 5 in the other direction in order for the momentum to be canceled out and be totally summing up to zero again. All right, and so just to end off here, we're going to look at an example of what can be kind of tricky is when momentum is conserved in two different directions, okay? And so when that happens, you basically have these two equations, one for the x direction, one for the y direction. And so our problem looks like this. We have a gray hockey puck initially with a velocity of 10 meters per second. It collides with a green hockey puck, which is initially at rest. And then we're given the information about the two hockey pucks. The green puck is seen to go off at an angle of 35 degrees above the x-axis. The gray puck comes off. 55 degrees below the x-axis. We want to know is what's the velocity, or I'm sorry, we're also told that the velocity of the gray puck is 5.73. We want to know is what is the velocity of the green puck. So assume the pucks have the same mass. 
So we look here at our bird's eye view. Now these are hockey pucks, so they're on ice, and so there is no force in the x and y directions uh, on them. Okay, there is no friction or anything like that. So momentum is conserved uh, in both directions, the x and the y. Okay, so this is on ice, and so there's no friction, and so there's no external forces in any direction. Now, this is a collision, and one thing to just keep in mind is, so this is really important. This stuff, we just did an example for an explosion, an example for a collision. Okay, momentum is almost always conserved in a collision and an explosion. Even if there are outside forces sometimes, because generally those are so tiny that they're much smaller. But these two examples, it's pretty crystal clear that they're both conserved. So the way we do this is we go through and uh, set up our equations and use this momentum conservation. So we'll start here uh, with the initial picture. So initially the puck comes in with a velocity of 10 meters per second. So this puck is 10, uh, this puck is zero. Uh, and this would be in the x direction. Notice that there's nothing initially in the y direction. Finally, uh, the pucks come off like this. And so we call uh, the velocity of the second particle v sub b and so we know that that's an angle of 35 degrees. So make a little triangle uh, like so with the x and the y coordinates. Uh, and so the x would be vb cosine 35. The y would be vc sine 35. We do the same thing with the gray puck, except here we actually know what the hypotenuse is. We set up, we can find this guy, the x component, and the y component using the cosine and sine of 55. We get these two numbers. Keep in mind, Momentum can be negative, so the y component of the gray puck is actually negative 4.69. Uh, now to set this up, momentum is conserved in both directions. Sometimes you need to use both, sometimes uh, you can use one or the other. But in this case, using the y direction will be enough for us. And so we set up our equation like this, and the y direction, as we said, there is no momentum initially. And finally, uh, this one puck is going downwards, uh, 4.69 meters per second. Uh, and the, the green one is going upwards, upwards momentum like so. Uh, and here, since they have identical masses, you can cancel out the mass and solve for the velocity. And you get 8.2 meters per second. So it's similar to the explosion problem in that the upwards momentum of the green puck had to balance the downwards momentum of the gray puck in order to equal zero initially. Now in this case, that's all you needed for this problem, but it's nice uh, to go through and just show that it works in the other direction. So in the x direction, initially, uh, this puck wasn't moving, the green one was, uh, and afterwards we have their information finally. And if you plug in the new velocity of 8.2, you get that basically these two things are equal.